I, how about every head bowed, every eye closed? I, I don't really know if I need to preach. They already did it. That was remarkable. Amen. Very well done. My hat's off to uh, these. Matthew, if you have your Bible, Matthew. Yeah. I have my Bible right here. I just got to get it to cooperate. Hallelujah. There we go. Matthew chapter 14. It's a great joy to be here. I count it an honor, privilege to be with you. I was trying to remember the last time I was here. I think it was 2015, but it might have been before that. I don't. It's been a long time. It's good to see you all again. And it's, a, it's just a great joy to be here with you, with your pastors, uh, with everything God is doing. It's a great feeling in here tonight. I'm going to preach on, on a text that you're all very familiar with. And there's probably been many, many sermons preached on it. Um, but I know that sometimes a different, just all you got to do is look at it from a slightly different angle. And it opens up and uh, uh, makes a great impact. It's, it's there. You've heard it. You've seen it. But all you got to do is shift by a couple degrees and you see something fresh. And that's what I'm praying is that God will do a fresh work in your heart this morning or this evening. For me, it's morning. I have no idea what time it is, to be honest with you. But... Uh, but it, uh, this, this evening, we want to take a look here at Matthew 14, and it ties right in, really, with what we just saw. It's called the comfort zone. And so let's read, beginning with verse 25, Matthew 14, verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I'm asking for a, an anointing of your spirit that will permeate every ear and every heart that listens tonight. I pray, God, that you will speak to them and challenge them. God, they will be willing to ask you to bid them to come. I pray if there's anyone here tonight that's not saved, you'll touch them with salvation. They'll get out of the boat of the world and they'll come and follow you on the water. I pray for miracles in people's hearts tonight in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So the first thing I want to think about with you is the enormous challenge of leaving the boat. Why would anyone in their right mind get out of a boat in the middle of a lake in a storm. Why would anybody do that? Why would this even cross Peter's mind? It's one thing to see Jesus walking on the water, but why would Peter think, oh, I've got an idea. Jesus, bid me come out on the water with you. I mean, why didn't he just say, Jesus, turn me into a fish? I'll swim out to you. Turn me into a bird. I'll fly. Why would he even think that getting out of the boat, even to walk with Jesus, was a good idea? I hate to say it, but I would never have thought about getting out of the boat. Amen. And if you're honest, maybe you wouldn't 
say the same thing. I've gotten older. When I was young, maybe getting out of the boat would be fun. When I was young, uh, maybe I would do something like that. But the older you get, the more physically risk averse you become. You're not so interested. I've got too many scars from my youth. I've got too many body parts that are complaining now that I'm older about what I did when I was younger. And so the truth of the matter is, taking that kind of risk really wouldn't appeal. But the truth of the matter is, I don't think it's just an old man's problem. I don't think it's just me that has a problem with risk. I think everybody's got a problem with risk. There's young people here tonight, and you think, oh, getting out of the boat, that would be so cool. It would be radical water sports, getting out on the, it's like surfing, man. It would be, it would be a, a, an exciting thing. I would do it. Yeah, but you get in a crowd of your peers and Jesus says witness to them and you won't do it. Because when it comes to your peers, you're a chicken. <laughs> Tell them about Jesus. <laughs> Preach the gospel. <laughs> See, you have a comfort zone you, you might be fine on the footy field, but when it comes to sharing your faith, that's a whole different thing, isn't it? All of a sudden, that's outside of your comfort zone. You're not, you're not happy to do that. You know, there's a lot of young men here tonight, and uh, you probably never get married. There's women all over the place, and you're too chicken to talk to them. You think about talking to them, it's like, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I mean, all you got to do is walk up and say hi. It's way outside of your comfort zone. Some of you might be fine pastoring the group that you have, but would you pioneer again? Or would you go into a foreign country? Would you go somewhere that isn't familiar and doesn't have the kind of food you like and doesn't even speak your language? Would you do that? I know you've already done this, but would you hear God call you again? Maybe your church is just reaching the point where it could actually plant someone into the field, but you're counting your dollars and you're counting the money and you're going, eh, I don't know, man. And you're looking at the guy you're thinking about sending out and you, and you go, ah, he's not ready yet. Yeah, like you were ready when you went out. <laughs> Nobody's ever ready. But what you're, what you're afraid of is taking a risk. Somebody took a risk on you. But you don't want to take a risk. It's outside of your comfort zone. You've got your happy, you know, your dirty dozen. You're happy with the people you got. I've got, you know, I got, and I got a pastor badge, and I got a, people call me pastor, and I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty down with that. But you know what? We're not called to just pastor a group of people. We're called to launch churches again and again. And again, and the truth of the matter is, you aren't really a church until you're reproducing your church. Until then, you're just kind of playing around in the shallows. But Jesus didn't call us uh, to just be content with a group of people. He called us uh, to send people all over the world. That's our calling. But that's not comfortable. It stretches us, it challenges us. And so we'd just rather play church. These disciples were old, or young actually, but they'd been around 
the Galilean lake for a while. They knew the currents. They knew the eddies. They knew the storms. They knew the winds. They knew the clouds. They were familiar uh, with all of the aspects of being on the water. Most of them had lived their lives on the water. But now something new was taking place, uh, and Jesus comes out to them walking on the water, and these experienced salty dogs freaked out. It's a ghost. They're calling Jesus a ghost because it's outside of their experience. It's outside of what they're used to. They're comfortable on the lake, but they are not comfortable with somebody walking on the lake. This is something totally new. It's a completely new challenge, and they didn't know what to do. They were out of their element. They'd seen a lot of things before, but nothing like this. And we all might have faith for the basics in life. We might have faith for God's provision and God's protection and God's help in the day-to-day -day experience, in the, in the realm that we're used to. But what happens when the provision that you need becomes absolutely excessive. It's out of control. You need far more money than, than you think God has. I mean, now you're up against the wall. And if the money doesn't come through, what are you going to do? And so, what do you do with your faith then? Or the protection that you need becomes an actual life-threatening situation. And how's your faith in that situation? What about uh, when your day-to-day -day life turns into, tor into a tornado? It gets completely out of control because we all have faith that fits comfortably in our faith box. But what happens when the challenges of life move outside of the faith box? Now our faith is being called upon to go somewhere we've never gone before to enter into an arena we think is beyond us. And it's outside of our comfort zone. And we'd rather not go there. Even Peter. You know, Peter was a bold, brash kind of guy. If any of the disciples were going to do it, it would have been Peter, right? But even Peter was not going to step out of the boat unless Jesus bid him to come. He wanted some kind of assurance. He wanted some kind of guarantee that this is going to work. If Jesus asks me to come, then maybe I will come. But really, he's not going to step out of the boat without that assurance. So I guess the big question for all of you here tonight is how far will you go if Jesus bids you? How far are you willing to follow him if he bids you? Would you speak to a hostile group of your peers whom you know will come against you, who will mock you, who will scorn you, who will reject you? Will you still lift up your voice and speak to them if Jesus should bid you to do so? And maybe you're thinking, well, yes, I would if Jesus bid me to do so. Well, he has already bid you to do so. He doesn't have to send you a written invitation. He has already bid you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Go, preach this gospel to every living creature. He's already bid you. Amen. Would you give a ridiculous amount of money at conference? Amen, we take five offerings. Would you give something outrageous? You know, every conference comes around and I expect to come home broke. My wife and I play a little game. The offerings go on through the week and each evening I, I say to her, what are you thinking? She looks at me and she says, what are you thinking? And I say, no, no, you go first. She says, no, you go first. So we always end up just, all right, tell you what, write it down. 
and we'll compare notes. So we both write our amounts down. Why is it my wife, 90% of the time, comes up with a bigger number than me? I'll tell you why. Because I'm the guy that works for the money. She just spends it. But I got to tell you, every time she shows me her note, I go, okay. 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 And we write it and we put it in. We get to the end of the week, we go, well, now what do we do? Well, I don't know, start over. Would you do that? If Jesus were to bid you to give lavishly, to give by faith, would you do it? Because you know he already has. He already has. Some of you have heard God speak a number to you and you've said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. That's way too much. But I, I love the offering this evening as we heard how God responded to giving and gave more because the truth of the matter is you can't outgive God. Amen. You missed a great place to say amen. I wish I had five friends here tonight. Would you push beyond your comfort zone? Would you go to some completely alien nation if Jesus bid you to do so? Because you know that he already has. And would you answer the call to be a pastor like our man in the skit who was all about the comfort zone? He wanted to create security. He wanted to get a bunch of money for his family, for his children. And uh, all of that's all well and good, but, but God was calling him. What if God is calling you? And maybe some of you go, I don't, I don't know if I'm called or not. I've got a sermon for you tomorrow night. But, but maybe you would say, I'm not sure, but, but let's just leave it at this. Would you ask him to call you? Because that's what Peter did. Lord, bid me to come. Would you ask Jesus, Lord, bid me to come? Or better yet, bid me to go. Bid me to do something ridiculous, something that's outside of my comfort zone. Comfort zones are profoundly limiting. You'll never really meet God in your comfort zone. The truth of the matter is Christianity is outside of our comfort zone. I've been saved for 50 years. I have seldom been comfortable with it. I have always felt God pushing me out of my comfort zone. The Sermon on the Mount is out my, outside of my comfort zone. Oh, I know, you all, you all are real good with the Sermon on the Mount. Oh yeah, I don't have a problem with the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemy. How's that working out for you? Huh? Oh, I just love my enemies. That's what the Sermon on the Mount calls us to. So much as look at a woman with lust in your heart. You've already committed adultery. I'm looking at all you men. How's that working out for you? Is that in your comfort zone? How about this? If you so much as call your brother a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. And he compares it to murder. And I'm looking at a room full of serial killers. <laughs> See, the Sermon on the Mount is outside of our comfort zone. We don't live that way naturally. You have to push beyond natural limits to live Christianity. Let me tell you a story. Okay, this, let, me just, let me just take you into a slice of my life. This is my Christianity, all right? I get saved. I'm a, I'm a dope-smoking hippie. I've been smoking dope. By the time I got saved, I'd been smoking dope for about eight or nine years. And it was pretty much a daily thing. 
I mean, I had fried my brain. I didn't have much of a memory left. And I get saved. I got long hair, believe it or not. I used to have long hair. I used to have hair, it's amazing. I, it was the envy of all the girls. They looked at my hair and said, oh, how's it so wavy? It's so nice. Long hair. I get saved. So I end up in this little Bible study. There's no, there's no church anywhere near us. But a bunch of older guys have gotten together. I, by older, I mean they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And uh, they, they got this little Bible study on. So I started showing up with them. And uh, one of the guys in the Bible study has this great idea. He says, let's do a play and evangelize with drama. We weren't in the fellowship. This is, this is completely off the top. So this guy writes a script. It's The Last Supper. How many of you ever seen Leonardo da Vinci's painting, The Last Supper? You've all seen it, right? Jesus is in the middle of a long table, and the disciples are spread out on either side, and they're all talking and doing stuff, right? So he says, let's put a backdrop that looks like the back of the painting, and then we'll, we'll be the characters in that painting. We'll put Jesus in the middle and, and everybody will be stretched out along the table. And uh, we'll be frozen in place. And then at the proper cue, one of them will unfreeze and will tell a little story about himself and how he came to be with Jesus. And then every one of the characters, when they reach the end of their soliloquy, the end of their little story, each one would say, and now the master has told us that one of us will betray him. Is it I? And then we'd freeze back into our position. Hey, you know, pretty good idea. I kind of liked it. Kind of artsy fartsy. Sounds, sounds like maybe it'll be, a, a, you know, a, something that'll make impact. And so they asked me to be in it. Probably because I had long hair. I was the only guy in the group who had long hair. And so they want me to be Philip. And so I studied. I, now remember, I don't have a memory left. And I studied my, I, I've got to speak for three or four minutes. I've got to recite this story. And I got to get to the end of the story, and I got to say, now the master tells us one of us will betray him. See how well I remember it? This is, this is 1974, and I still remember it. Some painful memories will never leave you. <laughs> so I work at it, and work at it, and work at it, and I'm, I'm reciting it in the mirror, and I'm trying it on my dad, and I'm trying it on anybody who'll listen. And I'm working it, and I'm, I, I got, man, I got, I got this thing. I got this thing. So the night of the performance, we all take our places. And the stage is nowhere near as solid as this stage. This is pretty good. <laughs> Ours wasn't that good. Ours was two by fours with sheets on them that were painted, okay? All right, you're getting the picture. So, so here we are, and I'm Philip, and I'm next to Thomas. Thomas is weighing in at about 400 pounds. He's a big boy. I don't know how they figured Thomas was that big, but they, <laughs> they figured Thomas was a big boy, ate a lot of food, and so he's sitting next to me. I kind of have my hand on his shoulder, and I'm, I'm like this. So each one unfreezes. They come down the line. I'm on the the other side of Jesus here. So they work their way down. We've gotten through six. And now uh, Thomas does his bit. He, he just sits there and does his bit. And then it's my part. Here comes Philip, all right? So here I am and I unfreeze and I say, my name is Philip. I come from Bethsaida. I, 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 and I passed out. On the way down, I grabbed Thomas. 
Thomas comes down with me. The whole stage is going whoop, whoop, whoop. I hit the ground. I don't know how long I was out. It wasn't long. I woke up, came up from behind the table, looked around and said, is it I? <laughs> and God and Gabriel were in heaven laughing. I could hear them laughing. And God was slapping Gabriel on the back and saying, have you ever, ever seen anything like this? This guy, Lamb, is incredible. You know what we're going to do, Gabriel? We're going to make him a preacher. Can we say outside my comfort zone? <laughs> right? Uh, so just, just to prove my point, they send me out. And my best friend Scotty's there. He's helped me load the truck, and he's looking kind of sad because we have a lot of fun together, and I'm getting ready to leave. And I just looked at him. I said, Scotty, don't worry. This isn't going to work. I will be back before six months are over. And my first sermon, okay, this is before we had computers, before we had iPads, everything was handwritten. I had been working on the sermon for, you know, well, I knew I was going out, so I, I, I was door director for three months, so I knew I was going out. I thought I had a few more months to go, but Pastor Mitchell liked to just send people out all the time. So, so I've been working on my sermon for three months, and, uh, and I, I, you know, this is my first sermon. This, okay, I got it all handwritten, I can read it, I'm ready to go, and, and I, I put my water up on the, up on the podium because I, I knew I was gonna get thirsty, and so I, I started preaching, and I got excited. I slap the pulpit, and the water comes down, and I watch all of my notes run to the bottom of the page, and all I've got is a white page with a blue line at the bottom. And God and Gabriel were in heaven laughing. And God says to Gabriel, I told you, this guy was going to be a million laughs. And they've been laughing ever since. Way outside of my comfort zone. But really, almost everything I've ever done for God has been outside my comfort zone. Witnessing is a challenge. Giving liberally is a challenge. Loving people that are hard to love is a challenge. It's always outside of our comfort zone. You become comfortable with what you're used to, so you don't stretch yourself into what you're not used to. And the only reason that I would do the things that I have done through the years is Jesus bid me to do it. And when he bids me, I got to do it. And so do you. This isn't Scott Lamb hour. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about everybody in this place. There's not one of you that can dodge this bullet. I'm aiming for your heart. And if you're honest, you will say, I'm not sure I like this, because I'm talking about you. Well, wait a minute, it only gets worse, all right? So the first question was, why would Peter say to the Lord, bid me to come walk on the water? Why would he even do that? Why would he go there? And Jesus bids him, okay, come. And so he gets out of the boat, and he starts walking on water. 
you would think that once he started walking on water, that was it, right? He had faith to do what Jesus asked him to do. He steps out of the boat, and he's walking on water. And he's thinking, man, look at me. I'm walking on water. And then he looks around, and he sees the waves, and he starts to sink. Didn't he see the waves before he got out of the boat? Wasn't it the same storm? Wasn't it the same winds? Why, after doing the hard part, the hard part's getting out of the boat. The hard part is taking that step of faith and going somewhere where you've never gone before. Do something you've never thought you could do. I never thought that I could preach the gospel. I never thought that I could pastor effectively. I never thought I could build a church. I ventured, I stepped out of the boat. Peter stepped out of the boat and then he started to sink. We've all heard this sermon and read, well, he saw the waves and he was afraid. But you gotta dig a little deeper because you already seen the waves. Why, once he got out on the water, did he sink? Says he saw the waves again. Well, he'd already seen them. It's just like the question of Israel. Why would Israel experience God's deliverance from Egypt in so many supernatural ways? All of the plagues, the final plague, killing the firstborn throughout Egypt. They run them out of Egypt, but before they go, they fill them with treasure. Take, here, take all my gold. Take all my, that's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous story. But God does ridiculous things. And so here are these people, they're saying, take my money, take my money, and off they go with all their money. They get down to the Red Sea, they look back, and now Pharaoh's changed his mind again, and he's coming after them with the chariots, and they freak out. Where are we gonna go, what are we gonna do? And God says, don't worry, I got this. And the first thing he does is he sends his angels down to unscrew all the wheels. I love it, God's got such a sense of humor. He takes the lug nuts off of their cars. Now, let's see him drive now. The ones that still are mobile are coming down on Israel. And what does God do? He parts the Red Sea. They walk across on dry land. Pharaoh and his chariots follow. And God closes the Red Sea. And the mightiest army of that epic is destroyed in an instant by the hand of God. They've seen this. This is how they've lived. They go through the wilderness, God provides. He blesses them again and again. They come up to the border of Canaan, the promised land where they're heading. They send in the spies and the spies come back and two of them are still holding on to their faith. The other 10 are saying, oh, you know, there's big guys down there, there's big guys. Big guys. God just wiped out the Egyptian army. What are you worried about big guys for? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Right? If God can kill Egypt, he can kill Palestinians. They weren't called Palestinians back then. Philistines, Ammonites, Midianites, termites, all kinds of critters. God can kill them all, but they freak. Why, after you have seen God move, do you panic and freeze, just like Peter? I've thought about this at length, and the only answer that I can come up with is there's a demonic pushback on your faith. Hell itself hears you say to your wife, you know what, honey? I think we're called to go preach the gospel. And hell itself says, oh, we'll see about that. You and your wife sit in conference, talk about the money you're gonna give, and the devil says, oh, we'll see about that. You say, you know what, babe? We're gonna raise godly children. They're gonna live for God. We're gonna raise another generation of preachers. And the devil says, oh, we'll see about that. 
We'll see about that. In, in Las Vegas at the poker tables, they have a, a saying, it's part of the game, part of the game of poker is, I will raise you and I will see you. And what that means is that I have placed a wager. I have said, I'm gonna go preach the gospel. And the devil says, I will raise you. In other words, I'm gonna require even more from you. You're gonna to have to put more money into the kitty. And then I will call you. I'll see what you have. And the devil plays that game with you every time you try to step out in faith. I'm believing God for my marriage, which is struggling. And the devil says, oh, okay, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. You got a hole in the platform there, Be careful. See that, the devil, that's the devil right there. <laughs> I'm just trying to preach. He's trying to kill me. <laughs> Says my kids are going to live for God. They come home with 666 tattooed on their forehead. I'm believing God for, for financial blessing. And pff, you lose your job. A anybody with me? Anybody, anybody here know what I'm talking about? Any of you ever try to step out in faith? And the devil says, we'll see about that. Oh, that doesn't happen in Zambia? I guess the devil's too busy in America with me to <laughs> mess with you. We'll see about that. And as soon as you step out and do something, the devil says, we'll see about that. Every couple in here who has ever left the boat to go pioneer, stepped out by faith, believing that God was gonna do great things right into the jaws of opposition. They get to their city, they hang up their shingle, they got their building, they're ready to go and nobody shows up. And they're out witnessing and nobody wants to get saved. And then the only people that do wanna get saved are half insane. And they come to church and sit in the front row and go And you're doing the best you can, but what's going on? This isn't as easy as it looked. And all I'm telling you is, there's pushback. There will always be pushback. Anytime you do something for God, the devil will say, we'll see about that. And he will challenge every step that you take. The storm didn't stop when Peter got out of the boat. The enemies of the land of Canaan did not flee when Israel showed up. I believe that this is when the question of faith and courage really are put to the test. Not getting out of the boat, but what happens right after that? What happens when you say, I'm gonna do this for God and the devil pushes back? And it's the, in the middle of an act of great faith where you're genuinely believing God that you sometimes feel like your faith is failing. Oh, ye of little faith. Isn't that what Jesus said to Peter? Why did you doubt? Well, because that's what the devil does. He pushes back on your faith. When you say, I'm going to do something for God, he pushes back on your faith. You step out of the comfort zone and he says, we'll see about that. And the truth of the matter is faith part one getting out of the boat, will always require faith part two. You're always going to, as I said, the devil says, I will see you and raise you. I'm sorry, I will raise you and I will see you. I will raise the stakes. As soon as you step out, the devil raises the opposition and your faith is on the line. And now you have to have a whole nother part of faith. You had faith to get out of the boat. Now you got a whole nother part of faith. Faith part two is right here in our story. Who did Peter cry out to when he started to sink? He cried out to the very man who put him at risk. Whose idea was it to get out of the boat? Jesus. Who's he call on when he sinks? Jesus. Who else 
going to call on? Buddha, save me. Confucius, save me. Judas, throw me a rope. Yeah, that'd be a bad idea. All of a sudden, he's sinking. And who does he call on? He calls on the only person any of us can call on. That's Jesus Christ. And when you come up against the opposition, you have to respond with Jesus Christ. Jesus, save me. And you know why he did that? Because he knew Jesus would save him. And you know why he knew Jesus would save him? Because that's what Jesus does. Jesus didn't just walk over to the spot where Peter went under and just sort of watch until the bubbles stop. And then just sort of, oh, dang. I kind of liked Peter. Now I got to go get a whole new disciple. God, I don't think this was... He shouldn't have got out of the boat. That's not the way it went. The Bible says immediately he put out his hand. He said, I got you, man. I got you. Fifty years down the road, I can't tell you how many times I have heard Jesus say, I got you. I got you. I'm not going to let you go under. Oh, beloved, listen to me. You can trust Jesus as far as you can imagine. You can trust Jesus in the impossible. You can trust Jesus when it looks like it's never going to happen. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He's not going to let you go under. Isaiah 41, 10, fear not. There it is again. For I am with you. Be not dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I'll pull you out of the water, Peter. I'll pull you out of the water. Because that's what I do. That's who I am. And some of you right now are thinking, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that all sounds good on paper, but if it's going to be that tough, eh, I'm going to give it a miss. It's going to be that challenging. I'm pretty comfortable right here, and I really, really don't want to do that. I don't, I don't really want to risk. And you know what? You can do that. But you'll never know what it's like to walk on water. Because you'll never encounter God in the comfort zone. He's outside the comfort zone. You want to meet with God? You got to walk on water. Verse 32 says, when they got in the boat, talking about Jesus and Peter, when they got in the boat, hey, wait a minute, how'd they get back in the boat? Well, they walked on water, right? Peter sank, Jesus reached out his hand, Picked him up, but I guarantee you he didn't carry Peter back to the boat. Come on, Pete. You know, here's Jesus, skinny little Jesus. Here's Peter, big fisherman. Come on, come on, Peter. I'll get you back to the boat. Don't worry about your little feet. I won't let them get wet. No, you know how Peter got back to the boat? He walked with Jesus. He's walking on water. Hey, Jesus, this is pretty cool. Yeah, it is. I told you it'd be fun. Yeah, I like this walking on water. If you never get out of the boat and you just stick with the comfort zone, you know what's going to happen? You're going to fade into the giant pillow of comfort. You'll just sink into it. Little by little, you'll just sink into that comfortable pillow and you'll become a sterile, unfruitful, religious weirdo. 
because that's what the comfort zone produces. If you don't have living encounters with God, you'll lose it. And the only way you can have a living encounter with God is step out of the boat. Amen. I wish I had five friends here tonight. There are people who are timid souls who will never experience the power of God. Theirs is a powerless faith. They acknowledge God, but they deny the power. So imagine this. I close with this thought. Here's the 12. No, the 11. I'm sorry. One went and hung himself because he never figured it out. But here's the 11 disciples. Jesus is risen. He's ascended. They're all, you know, they're still living their life. They're all together. They're sitting around the campfire telling Jesus stories. Wasn't it incredible when Jesus healed those blind eyes? He just spat in the dirt and put that mud on that guy's face. That was incredible. And he, he could see. Yeah, that was good. That was good. And the time he healed that leper man, his skin right in front of our eyes was that was incredible. And another disciple says, yeah, and what about when he raised Lazarus from the dead? That was, that was probably the best miracle I ever saw. And they're all talking about the miracles. And everybody's going around the campfire talking about the amazing Jesus stories that they'd seen. And then it gets to Peter, and Peter always says the same thing. He says, yeah, that's all cool. It's amazing. I saw all that. But... I walked on water. <laughs> and none of you ever walked on water. In fact, I am the only man in history that ever walked on water. I got stories to tell. Me and Jesus walked on water. John, beloved John, I saw you in the boat. I saw you looking over the rail. I saw you freaking out as I went under. You didn't even reach a hand out. You didn't even care. But I. James, you were there. Thomas, you didn't weigh 400 pounds yet. You could have walked on water. Peter had a story to tell. You got any stories? You got any stories? You'll never have stories if you stay in the comfort zone. Just a nice, comfortable Christian. Just come to church on Sunday. Hallelujah. Sing a little bit. Give a little bit. Listen a little bit. Go home. That's your Christianity. That's the whole shooting match right there. Time for you to wake up and get out of the boat. Amen. Good preaching, Lamb. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not a Christian. You're not born again. You know what your problem is? You're in the world's boat. And the world tells you every day what to do. I used to be in that boat. And it's the boat of social acceptance. And it's the boat of what's cool and what's hip and what's everybody else doing. It's the boat. It's all about sin, because that's what we do when we don't have Jesus, we sin. I was a drug addict, I was a, 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 an alcoholic, I was, I was a, an immoral man. And I got saved, and it totally changed my life. But it was so outside of the way I'd been living or the way any of my friends lived. It was way outside the comfort zone. And some of you are going to go to hell in the comfort zone because you wouldn't ask Jesus to save you. Because if you did that, it would put your popularity at risk. It would put your money at risk. It would put your 
character at risk with people. They'd all of a sudden look at you and say, he's a Jesus freak. And you wouldn't be invited to any more parties and you, your friends wouldn't want to hang with you anymore. And that's why you won't get out of the boat because you're afraid. You're afraid of what you'll lose. Can I tell you something? Just, just receive it from an older man who's been around. I didn't lose nothing when I gave my life to Jesus. Oh yeah, I know, all my friends abandoned me. I was no longer a popular hippie, I was no longer anything. I did, you know, I could whine and complain about that, but what I got was so much more than what I left behind. What I received from Jesus was what my heart desperately needed. It was broken and it needed fixing. I needed a healing in my mind. I needed a healing in my life. I needed God to do a miracle. And so one night I just threw all caution to the wind and I said, okay, God, if you are who you say you are, then fix me. And he did. He did. He came into my heart in such powerful ways that here I am 50 years down the road and I'm still in love with Christ, probably more in love with him now than I've ever been. Still amazed, still filled with wonder at the life he's given me. And you're here tonight and you're not a Christian. Can I invite you to get out of the boat that's sinking because the boat of the world is sinking. Can I invite you to get out of that boat and walk on water with Jesus? Get your first miracle. You know what your first miracle is? Salvation. That's your first miracle. When you give your life to Christ and he touches your heart and he reveals the truth and you know he's who he is because of what he does. You're here tonight. You're not a Christian. You want Jesus to come into your life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Raise your hand right where you're seated. Say, pray for me. I'm not born again. I'm not a man or a woman of faith. I have not given my life to Jesus, but tonight I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Raise your hand all over this building, up here in the balcony. Raise your hand. Down here on my right. Over here on my left. Everybody in here is born again Christian? How about backsliders? We got any backsliders here? People who have just kind of drifted away into the comfort zone? I see that hand. God bless you. Who else? Join this honest heart. Come on. Come on, don't be afraid. This is not the time to be afraid. Jesus is calling you. You're backslidden. Raise your hand where I can see it. Put it right, put it right up. There's a hand over here. God bless you, sir. Who else? Raise your hand. Join these honest hearts. Up in the balcony. Some of you kids up there. I, you guys are not shooting straight. Raise your hand. Backslider, raise your hand. Un I see that hand. God bless you, sis. Who else? Join these honest hearts. Here's a hand here. God bless you. Who else? Who else? Tonight's the night to get saved. Tonight's the night to follow Christ. Raise your hand. I see that hand over there. God bless you. There's a hand up here. God bless you. I see that hand. Who else? I want every one of you that raised your hand. Get out of your seat right now. Come to this altar. Get out of your boat. Get out of your boat. Come right here. Jesus is going to meet with you right here. Come right now. You raised your hand. There are kids over here. You raised your hand. Come. You raised your hand. Come. Don't sit there. Come. God bless you people. God bless every one of you. Sister over here. Amen. Hallelujah. Who else? Come right now. God bless every one of you. God wants to help you. He don't want to kill you. He wants to save you. Peter cried out, Jesus, save me. And what did he do? Saved him. That's what he wants to do with you. Look at all these folks coming. They want Jesus to save them. This is the right move. This is, <laughs> this is where it all begins. If you don't cry out for Jesus to save you, you're going to end up sinking. That'll be the end of you. God bless every one of these folks. We, folks are still coming. Altar workers need to be looking. You need to be connecting with folks. There's people down here need folks to pray with them. Hallelujah. A couple sisters over here. Three sisters. No, yeah, no, this one's got someone praying. I need a sister here, a sister here. Hallelujah. 
Praise God for every one of these. Thank God. Let's thank God for a moment. Let's just thank him for these souls. Let's thank him for what he's doing right now. Oh, God, we do praise your name. We thank you for salvation, for the loosing of your spirit in this place. We are grateful. Every Christian here, every Christian, you living in your comfort zone? Is that how you live your Christianity? You know, you just kind of coast. You're not sinning. You're not. It's not like you're doing something wrong. But you're not experiencing Jesus the way you could be. And it's because (laughs) pushing into that realm of faith. I mean, I get it. I've been there. Most of my life I've been there. And faith is a challenge. Faith, I heard a singer once say, faith is a burden. It's a weight to bear. It's brave and bittersweet. And and it's hard to hold on to. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Those are great lyrics. It's a great song. You're here tonight. You believe God, you love God. But how about pushing it? How about taking it a little further? You know what, we got two nights left in this conference. I heard a wonderful skit where the pastor was upbraiding the young man who was procrastinating and waiting. And then I heard Pastor George say, some of you men need to tap your pastor on the shoulder and say, I'm ready. This altar's open. God's speaking to every one of you. Maybe you don't know what God wants you to do. Come to the altar and say, God, ask me. Bid me to come. Ask me to do anything. Ask me to get out of the boat. Ask me to leave my comfort. Ask me to leave my secure situation ask me to give ask me to love ask me to preach I don't know what you want but I will do whatever you want me to do and I don't care how far out of the comfort zone it is get a hold of God at this altar we're going to sing this song myself away so you can use me I give myself away Oh God I give myself away So you can use me I give myself away I give myself away so you can use me My life is not my home To you I belong I give myself, I give myself to you My life is not my home To you I belong I give myself, I give myself to you, yeah. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Lord, I give myself. I give myself away so you can I give myself I give myself away all I give I give myself away so you all I give myself I give myself away All I give, 
I give myself away so you hold and give myself I give myself away all I give I give myself away so you